So uh, we have four of our Missouri leaders and experts to sort of address some of the issues that uh, Susan talked about during her presentation. I thought she did a fabulous job of framing these issues as being more than just about the Affordable Care Act, but about the tremendous changes we're facing in healthcare in general. Um, at the end of this panel, I've asked a couple of people who are in the audience to stand up and talk about their experience. We have uh, someone here, uh, Aaron Sweeney, who's a um, certified application counselor at the Federally Qualified Health Center. And we also have Jeremy Malarski in the audience, who's leading Primaris's effort on navigation. So they're both going to talk about their experiences, which I think will be really fun. Uh, later in the afternoon, uh, Lori Johnson's in the audience, and she's going to talk a little bit. She's going to stand up and talk a little bit about um, the intersection between some of the programs like Meaningful Use and HIPAA. So there's just so much change going on in healthcare right now. And um, if, if you're looking at something that's 17 or 18 percent of the economy, it's not going to turn on a dime. It's going to be incremental. I was sort of smiling when she was talking about um, raising rates for primary care providers, because while we did have a two-year increase um, up to Medicare rates for primary <laughs> care providers and the Affordable Care Act, um, I don't know a lot of primary care providers that really feel like they're going to make a lot more money. Deb. Uh, do you think? Yeah, so I know a lot of specialists who know we're going to make less money, but I don't know a lot of primary care providers who think they're going to make a lot more money. So it, it's just going to be fun to see it all play out. Um, our panel today, we're going to go in the order you see in your program. So Herb Kuhn is going to start, and um, he's the president and CEO of the Missouri Hospital Association. He's going to be followed by Bob Hughes, who's the president and CEO of the Missouri Foundation for Health. Um, third, we have John Huff, who is the director of the Missouri Department of Insurance, Financial Institutions, and Professional Registration. And we're delighted that Kit Wager could actually come today because the government's open and be our fourth panelist uh, from the Department of Health and Human Services for Region 7 to talk about what's going on in Missouri. So we'll get started. Herb, can you start us off? Well, good morning, and thank you for this opportunity to be part of this program. You know, as you listen to Susan, it's exhausting to be in healthcare right now. I mean, think about it. We've got exchanges, we've got consolidation, uh, we've got uh, acute and post-acute care uh, reforms that are going on. We've got meaningful use, physician and hospital alliances, hospital acquired conditions, re uh, readmissions, bundling, and personalized medicine. Again, it's exhausting, but one of the foundational things that we're going to have to deal with all this as we go forward is to deal with this fundamental issue that Susan talked about and what we continue to talk about across this state is how do we make a lot of these changes when we have 810,000 in the state of Missouri that are currently uninsured. Missouri's hospitals, uh, like hospitals all across the country, have really begun to embrace pretty aggressively the notion of the triple aim, better care, better health, lower costs. But again, how do you really be able to make those go forward? And I want to talk about that a little bit today when we have so many uninsured in the state of Missouri. So let me start this conversation with a little bit about what I call the holy grail of healthcare policymaking. How do we continue to align these interests to make sure we get the results that we all want to achieve that are embraced in the, in the triple aim? So let's start out with the notion of a healthy consumer. So if we have a healthy consumer, do we have continued health or do we have a preventable condition? And if it is a preventable condition, what kind? Is there no hospitalization or is there an acute care episode? And if there is an acute care episode, what kind is it? Is it one that's efficient and a successful outcome? Is it one that's high cost but also yet a successful outcome? Or is it one that results in complications, infections, and readmissions? This is population health. This is what Susan's talked about. This is what everybody keeps talking about. This is the model. It's what we all aspire to continued health, no hospitalization if possible, and efficient and successful outcome as part of the process. This is the model we have now, however. We all know that's driven by the fee-for-service, the piecework system, all the incentives are to do more in a piecework system that's out there. But if we're going to go this direction, we're getting a lot of push to do this. Um, a lot of it coming from CMS and other payers. Started in the Bush administration, continues in the Obama administration through the Affordable Care Act. 
but where CMS, Medicare, other payers are no longer going to be a passive payer, just simply paying the bills when people get sick. But they really want to be an active purchaser of high quality, efficient care to drive this model into the future. But also to drive this model in the future, we're going to have to be innovative as part of the process. And we're seeing a lot of that innovation in Missouri right now. The physician group practice demo, the precursor to the accountable care organizations, was one of the nine, one of the ten sites was pioneered here in Missouri at Mercy System down in, in, uh, in uh, Springfield. We have a number of ACOs that are taking off here in Missouri. We have a lot of work in terms of medical homes and a lot in terms of the community assessments that are testing new models, new partnerships to make this dream, which you see right here, a reality as we go forward in Missouri. But the challenge for this continues to be, what do you do when you have 810,000 in the state of Missouri that are uninsured to make that happen? So let's go on and look at a little bit about what that challenge means for us. Here's Missouri's national health care ranking. Right now, we're 42nd in the nation. That means we're eighth from the bottom. Two decades ago, we were 24th in the nation. That's a 75% drop over two decades. That's a challenge. Here's where we are on the individual health care rankings out there. We're ranked in the bottom 10 among all states in 12 of 42 categories. So without improvement in health status, how do you realize the goals of the triple aim? That is better care, better uh, lower costs, and uh, better health as part of the process. It's interesting when you look at this, though, however, notwithstanding this fall to 42nd, we are beginning to make some gains. Let me just share with you a new report that we put out this week, which is a follow-on to a report that we did two years ago that look at the ARC, the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, 12 preventable quality indicators, the PQIs that are out there. Three are acute, nine are chronic. We put the report out uh, this week on all counties across the state of Missouri. And it's interesting when you start to look at the data out there and the improvements, however, that we are seeing in care out there. So, for example, in Missouri, over the past decade, from 2003 to 2013, we had an 18.8% decrease in terms of uh, preventable uh, hospitalizations as part of the process in, with those, nine, those 12 PQIs, an 18.8% decrease. For the chronic rate, it was down 16.4. For the acute, it's 22.2%. But overall, preventable hospitalizations represent just basically 10% or one out of 10 of the hospitalization in the state of Missouri. But over the last decade, we've made great progress to a savings of about $2.4 billion for the state statewide as the effort. So notwithstanding these troubling numbers, progress is being made. But when you really drill down on the data, you see some interesting facts about the state of Missouri. So, for example, in 2005, we had the largest single increase that year in terms of the pneumococcal vaccine. It went up 3%. The following year, we had a 13% decrease in community-acquired pneumonia in 2006. Public health does work. These interventions do make sense, and they can realize real savings if we move forward and we make the investments that are necessary out there. So going on a little bit further, when you talk about the value of insurance, this is some work that we put out in a report that came out in September called the Two Missouris. And all it did is really try to correlate those that are uninsured with basically life expectancies across the state. Now, Susan talked about all the other data out there, and I would be the first to admit that there's a lot of other noise in this data that needs to occur. Um, poverty, uh, issues of uh, violence, different things out there. But when you begin to really look at the data and the correlations that you begin to see in terms of the uninsured and life expectancy in the state, they correlate very strongly as part of the effort that's out there. So, for example, if you're down in Pemiscott County, your life expectancy is 71 years. But if you're sitting in counties like St. Charles, Platte, and Mercer, it's 80 years. What a difference it makes as part of the process. The other interesting aspect, and I'll pull this one out and share with you as well, we did a, uh, this Two Missouris report, and Susan talked about the work that Kate Becker and others at Harvard did in, in terms of Oregon. Some really terrific work that looks at these issues out there. We did that overlay of that research that they did in Oregon with what's going on in Missouri. So if we were to have insurance here in Missouri, the difference would be remarkable. So for example, diagnosing de uh, depression, you get another 22,500 diagnoses across the state. That would be a big impact in terms of mental health in the state as part of the process. Cholesterol and mammography screens could go up maybe 109,000 for individuals out there. What a difference would that would make in terms of the health status as you try to deal with population health with that population. And those who really struggle with catastrophics from healthcare spending, the ones that go with bankruptcy, all the issues that are out there, 
could be reduced by nearly 11,000 in the state of Missouri if we had the opportunity for additional coverage out there. This is impactful. So let's go on and talk a little bit now about where we are in Missouri as we look at the Affordable Care Act and movement here. So here's kind of a stratification of Medicaid in the state of Missouri for 2012 and the utilization that's out there. So we've got the well and worried well, 80% of those on Medicaid, but it's only 19.2% of the population. The functionally chronically, chronically ill are 15%, but they're basically 30% of the spend that's out there, or 29% of the spend. But look at those frail, ill, and high utilizers. The 5% are frequent flyers, 22,000 in the state of Missouri, but it's 52.5% of our Medicaid spend out there. So what are we doing with these folks to really deal with them in a way that's effective? But how do we deal with this? Well, again, when you have 810,000 uninsured. But some good gains are being made where we can in this area. One area is the area of early elective deliveries, led by the March of Dimes. Really look at the fact that what it means when you induce labor at 37 weeks instead of going to 39 weeks. And the real opportunities for savings not only NICU use utilization, but also having these children really ready to go to school when they're ready to go. March of Dimes led this effort. I see Louise Propes in the audience and the St. Louis Business Council has done a lot of work in terms of leadership in this area. But we engaged all the hospitals across the state in this area. And I'm proud to, proud to say that of the hospitals across the state, 100% have now adopted a hard stop policy in this area. Didn't need legislation, didn't need regulatory effort, but it's part of the effort to improve population health to make a difference out there. And it's very impactful because if you think about it here in Missouri, 48% of the kids in the state of Missouri that are born are on Medicaid. One out of two births are on Medicaid in the state of Missouri. Think about not only the savings for the state of Missouri, but think about those who provide individual insurance and their companies to their employees to have these kind of changes out there. Population health is occurring in Missouri. It's slow, it's gradual, but these are important gains that we have out there. The other issues that we face, however, have to do with utilization in the emergency departments in the state. This shows you the numbers since 2004, what's gone on in terms of emergency department utilization and the red line going up are the uninsured that are out there. I can tell you right now, every minute of every day, there's an uninsured person coming into an emergency department in the state of Missouri seeking care. For the length of this conference today, probably for the time this conference began to when it ends today, 420 people in the state of Missouri will show up at an emergency department somewhere in the state of Missouri seeking care. Think about the number of people in this room, four times the number of the people in this room during the length of this conference will be showing up for health care service in the emergency department. We've got to do something different in terms of this delivery system that's out there. This shows the behavioral health issues. The sad joke in Missouri right now among hospital administrators is I've opened my new behavioral health unit. It's called my emergency department. They're being overwhelmed in terms of behavioral health issues. Our capacity for behavioral health in the state in terms of acute care beds have dropped 25% over the last decade. This is becoming a growing problem. The boarding numbers of people with behavioral health in hospitals across the state is acute. I can tell you in no uncertain terms, a big problem out there as we go forward. So those are our frequent flyers, the ones we need to deal with. But you also heard Susan talk about Dr. Brenner and the work that he's done up in New Jersey and kind of the work that he talked about in terms of, of hotspots. So let me talk a little bit about the hotspots here in the state of Missouri. For Medicaid, number one hotspot is St. Louis, and you can see the rates of ED utilization per thousand in this particular zip code. Here's number two in the state in Kansas City, and you can again see the rates per thousand, 526 in that area. And then let's look at number three down in Kennett that are out there. These are big numbers. These are important numbers as we think about it here in the state. The issue is that when you really get into the dollars or in the numbers, what you see is ED utilization really starting to spike about 8 o'clock in the morning, goes to about 10 o'clock at night. But in some of these hot spots, what you're seeing, particularly one in St. Louis and Kansas City, the high utilizers between 5 or 6 o'clock in the evening to 10 o'clock at night are women between age 18 and 35 and kids. You know what's going on. Mom comes home, kid's got an earache, got asthma, they're off to the emergency department. What kind of health care system are we building in the state that's one that's focused on moving people into the emergency department instead of clinics or into their medical homes or their primary care providers? How do we realize the triple aim if we don't have that kind of system that's out there right now? I'll give you a good example. I was in New York City not long ago and I was having a problem with my iPhone. I went into the uh, Apple store there to get some assistance. It was a fabulous store and I was asking them what their hours of operation was. They said, we never close because people in New York, 
because of their jobs, their work, need to access these services at all times of day. As we think about patient-centric healthcare systems, are we really building the system that supports the providers, or are we building the systems that are support the patients where they need us at the right time as we go forward? This is the key for us here, and I think this data really proves that point on a go-forward basis. And then finally, let me talk about this one. This one really bothers me. This is 2011, obviously these people come and go. It's what we call our really super utilizers in the Medicaid program in the state of Missouri. 51 people, 4,600 counters in the healthcare system. $5.2 million spend for the state of Missouri out there. We can do a heck of a lot better than this by getting better care coordination, realizing the trip lane, but how do we do this when we really face an issue where we have so many uninsured in the state and not movement towards coverage in this area? So let me just wrap up here with a couple of final thoughts. When you think about where we are in terms of Missouri Medicaid and the port and, 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 and coverage in the marketplace and the need to really advance the Affordable Care Act and make these, these changes. One of the, the numbers that I saw recently that really bothered me as we think about Missouri into the future is uh, information I saw from the Bureau of Economic Analysis. So we all know in the Medicaid program, it's a partnership with the federal government. They call the partnership the FMAP, the Federal uh, Medical Assistance Program, where the feds put up so much money, the state puts up so much money that's out there. So to give you a sense, Illinois is about a 50-50 match. Arkansas is about a 66-34 match, Kansas 57-43, Iowa 60-40, and Missouri is about 62-48 right now. But the data coming out right now shows that for 2015, Missouri is going to single, see the single largest increase, percentage increase, in their FMAP than any other state in the union. Now, if you're working for the state and you're doing the budgeting, you're saying, hey, this is pretty good news. That means another $150 million in general revenue that's coming our way. But think of what that means for the state. That means personal incomes in the state are dropping or not increasing at a rate relative to other states across the country. That's not a good position for Missouri. And one of the things that we have to think about if we're going to realize the Affordable Care Act, make the changes we need, is really have robust coverage for people as one of the tools in our toolkit to help drive not only income, but realize the, the, the gains of, the, of uh, population health as we go forward. So, as I said at the outset, where we think about it and as we look at it as hospitals, lots of good innovation going on, great changes out there, but it's hard to really realize the full potential of the Affordable Care Act and some of the things that we need to do with 810,000 uninsured out there. It's hard to realize the gains when you're looking at over a billion dollars a year in terms of uncompensated care here in the state of Missouri. It's hard to really look at it in that way when you see every minute of every day someone coming to an emergency department in the state of Missouri that's uninsured as part of the process. So I think, as Susan said, lots of opportunities, but coverage is going to be one of the key foundational issues for us, and that's one of the areas that we're so focused on from the hospital side. Thank you. Please um, write down your questions that you have. We're going to take questions at the end. I know I have questions for her, but I'm going to hold mine too. So let's, let's just save them for the end, and we're going to go right through the panel. Thank you, and good morning. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. We're talking about the ACA and we're in 2013. Um, these pictures just remind us that um, we're part of a, a long history of efforts in this country to expand health insurance. And there have been a lot of folks uh, involved. We've made some real progress. And we are actually living in some pretty amazing historic times. Um, I want to echo Susan's point about the, the next five to ten years are critical ones for health and health care in this country. We have tremendous opportunities and um, uh, I, I in many ways couldn't be more optimistic for those of us that were around when national health insurance was just around the corner in the 1970s. It's actually quite thrilling to think, my goodness, we're now talking about implementation. It's actually quite exciting. So my remarks today are going to be about uh, the Missouri Foundation for Health and the ACA and the intersection and talk a little bit about our agenda. And I, I thought I'd start with um, this model of community health. And this is uh, taken from, this will be familiar to many of you. It's taken from the University of Wisconsin. Um, it's their sort of the conceptual underpinnings for their county health rankings. and. Um, this is, in some ways, 
similar to um, the Institute for Healthcare Improvement's triple aim model, uh, efforts to kind of put the clinical care system into a larger context. And I want to just use this to make a couple of points um, because um, given our mission at the Missouri Foundation for Health, which is to improve the health of the underserved and the underinsured in our region, um, we do take this comprehensive approach. And we're interested ultimately in the outcomes and taking into consideration the various factors that, that lead to those outcomes. So I wanna, I wanna just draw on two points here on this slide. The first is, um, which Susan documented so nicely, um, that there are many factors in addition to clinical care that influence the health outcomes of our population. And these are listed here on the side. Secondly, recall that the Affordable Care Act, although it certainly is long and broad, it's predominantly about health insurance and about the clinical care system and beginning to see the innovation for the transformation of the healthcare delivery system. It really is much less about all those other factors that influence health. And one of the things that, um, one of the reasons that's so important to us at the Missouri Foundation for Health is we do a lot of work with the nonprofits who are providing the social and economic services that support people that are outside the clinical system. And one of the interesting things that the, we've heard about population health already from uh, both Herb and Susan, one of the interesting things that the Affordable Care Act has done is raise the question for us in communities, in states, and in the country is what does population health really mean? What are the dimensions of that that we're gonna have to wrestle with? And um, uh, we will, I think, perhaps come back to that maybe in discussion um, about what I think is going to be a real interesting ripple effect of the Affordable Care Act as well as other factors on our nonprofit sector here in Missouri over the next three <laughs> to five years that may face some significant changes that um, parallel but lag a couple of years behind the changes that are unfolding in the healthcare system um, and the delivery system per se. So let me move on now to the foundation uh, strategy. Um, we are uh, working to improve the health uh, and, uh, of uh, the uninsured and underserved, and we're doing that in several ways. First, uh, selecting four key health issues, sticking with them for five to 10 years, and making staff and financial commitments to achieve measurable results. We're responding to communities, taking the best ideas from the communities across our region to give them support for those things that are gonna have impact in their particular locations, and promoting state level policy. Um, just highlight there, there's a, um, actually kind of a fun, if you, um, if you like interactive things, there's, we put out a new report on our overall strategy on our website last week, um, and it nicely, sort of documents our strategy, goes into more detail, and if you're interested in that, I'd encourage you to go there, play around a little bit. Um, we've gotten some nice comments back about the fact that this is a little bit different than a usual kind of equivalent of an annual report. So if you have comments on that, please let us know. Um, staff who worked on that would like to hear it. Um, our targeted initiatives, our four targeted initiatives <laughs> that we've selected are um, preventing childhood obesity, expanding coverage, infant mortality, and oral health. And in the rest of my remarks, I'm really gonna concentrate on the last three of these with most of my remarks about expanding coverage and then a word or two about infant mortality and oral health. So our expanding coverage initiative is a statewide collaborative effort to coordinate a coalition of partners, uh, increasing awareness of and facilitate enrollment in the health insurance marketplace and to promote health insurance literacy. And um, this, is, this, co um, uh, this initiative has a number of parts, but the overall goal, and I think this is really what we all need to keep in mind and what we're all working on, uh, the shorthand is five and five. We want to reduce the percentage of Missourians who are uninsured to below 5% of the population in the next five years. That's an achievable goal. 
It's going to take a lot of hard work, but we think it's a, maybe it's a bit of a stretch, but we think we can do it as a, as a state and as a series of communities. So what are the activities that are part of this, underneath this initiative? Um, first one I'll highlight here is the Cover Missouri Coalition. I know many of you are um, participants in it. Um, we have several hundred members, uh, a couple of hundred organizational members, uh, over 300 individual members, and there are the principal activities, again, are to build awareness, to facilitate enrollment, to increase health insurance literacy. Um, there are work groups of the coalition. Uh, the coalition meets monthly, and each of the work groups also meets monthly. Uh, the foundation convenes this, but we're, we're very fortunate to have uh, a lot of partners who are working hard to make this work. Another component of the uh, coverage initiative is the Cover Missouri org website. Now some of you, I assume in this audience, are kind of policy wonks um, or analysts or like data and tables and those kinds of things. Um, so you may be familiar with CoverMissouri.org and if you go to it now you may think, wow, this has changed and in fact it has. It, it, um, this website has been uh, totally revamped. Uh, and shifted from the primary audience of uh, analysts and uh, researchers uh, and uh, policy wonks to consumers. So now this is a consumer-focused website with tools to help consumers around enrollment and awareness. So there are lots of educational materials. Um, they've now been translated into, I think, eight or nine different languages on the site, and we can get more translated uh, as there's uh, demand. There's a zip code locator so that um, you can go there, put in your zip code, and it'll give you the location of the nearest place you can go and talk to somebody in person about the enrollment process. Um, there's um, a list of education and enrollment events around the state. There's a hotline to talk to people on the phone, and there's a calculator um, that can give you an estimate of your, uh, what your uh, cost will be for uh, insurance when you enroll in the exchange. Now this is the same calculator that you'll get for those of you that have been knocking around on healthcare.gov like I have. It's the same calculator they point you to. It's, it's you know, we, we patched it in from, uh, you know, building on the uh, Kaiser Family Foundation calculator. We beg, borrow, and steal wherever we can to use those kinds of resources. Um, but the, um, uh, the overall um, point of this is to really be a, um, a connecting point for consumers to be able to get into a variety of streams to help them work through all the challenges of learning about and then enrolling uh, on the exchange. Now, this is um, uh, a resource, and uh, if you're writing anything down from what I say, if you're an analyst, this, I hope you'll write this down. Um, this is, uh, as you'll see at the top there, it says covermissouri.org backslash Medicaid. Um, this is actually uh, on the site, but it, you can't navigate to it when you go to the site. You have to put that in. And um, the reason is because this is for analysts, this is not for uh, this, is, this is not the kind of thing that uh, the everyday consumer is going to want to sit down and read through. It's not, this is about, um, these are materials that were prepared by foundation staff uh, as background for um, the stakeholders that were working this summer, had a series of hearings around the state that were exploring uh, medic, uh, reforms to uh, our state Medicaid program. And the materials are designed to, to be an objective and fact-based resource, and they're organized around these six topics. And um, uh, some of the foundation staff wrote some of these materials, but the vast majority of them come from Health Affairs, the Commonwealth Fund, National Association of State Health Policy, uh, and so on, a number of uh, places around the country that sort of pull all that together. So if you're interested in a in great resource in terms of um, uh, Medicaid reform, this is a great set of background materials for you. Another part of the coverage initiative is uh, health stories. 
Um, you heard Susan introduce this morning talking about the, the power of stories. They are important to communicate things. Um, and many of us who've been in health policy recognize we need to work better at making the connection between the policies that either are in place or that are being considered and the impact of those policies on people's lives. And this is a way to help demonstrate those and communicate those um, through the stories of individual people. You can go on, put in a few identifying pieces of information, either about yourself or you can help someone else do it. Um, and then you would be contacted to see if you were willing. Uh, and this information will not be used unless uh, you or the person involved uh, gives permission. It's confidential in, in, until you give explicit permission. But then the stories may be used to convey some of the issues and highlight the issues that people are facing. And um, a good example of this is if you go to uh, the Missouri Healthcare for All website, you can click on one of the stories and see the story that was run on the CBS Evening News a couple of weeks ago to illustrate the gap between our, our level of Medicaid coverage and then who's eligible for the exchange here in Missouri and what that means for a person. Um, and so um, I encourage you to do that and encourage you or patients or clients that you work with or family members to, put, to participate in this. Um, final component of the coverage initiative is a network of enrollment sites. Um, we're, uh, we selected uh, 17 organizations across the region to be either regional hubs or sites for enrollment and made awards of $5 million to these organizations. And very, very importantly, have been then collaborating with a number of other organizations, uh, Missouri Hospital Association, the FQHCs, um, the federally funded enrollment sites, Primaris and the um, uh, area agencies on aging and others um, to um, make sure that we have, with all of these kind of components, we have built, I think, in Missouri, a network of relationships and contacts and um, sort of intelligence gathering and working with consumers on the front line that can be a real resource over the next six months and I hope longer into the future to really have an impact and move the state forward in terms of our enrollment goals. So let me say uh, one quick thing about our two other initiatives that are influenced by the ACA. First is our infant mortality initiative. Here we're working uh, in St. Louis and in the boot heel um, in a place-based effort and this got un underway earlier this year and we're uh, establishing relationships and partnerships with some lead organizations in these regions. Um, and uh, I will say parenthetically, for those of you interested in infant mortality, um, there's a great article uh, in the Wednesday New York Times by Eduardo Porto, Porter that highlights um, this country's record in infant mortality over several decades and compares it with other countries and nicely explains why we've, uh, even though our rates have been declining, we're not doing nearly as well as we should be doing. And then finally, our oral health initiative. Um, our oral health status in Missouri is, again, not what it should be. Uh, we've been partnering with FQHCs, AT Still Dental School, and with many others uh, to begin to work on increasing the capacity of oral health services uh, in our region. Uh, and uh, the location where people can get services. So I will stop there. Um, I will say um, one of the things that makes the work that we do in conjunction with all of you and our partners is the ongoing participation and feedback that we get about how, how this can be better via the website, via uh, meetings, in talking with our staff, I hope you all will continue to give us uh, that feedback uh, so that we can continue to get better to improve the health of Missourians. Thank you very much. Thank you, Karen, and um, thank you for the opportunity to be here uh, to you in the center. I think this is my fifth year to attend. Um, uh, my name's John Huff. I'm director of the Missouri Department of Insurance, Financial Institutions, and uh, Professional Registration. Uh, and it's a pleasure to be here with you today. I'll give you a little different perspective than some of the other speakers. Uh, give you the uh, perspective from the uh, insurance regulator. Uh, regulator. 
uh, in the state of Missouri. Um, I was appointed in 2009, so if you fast forward to 2010, there were two pieces of major federal legislation that were passed in Congress, um, the, obviously the Affordable Care Act, but also the Dodd-Frank Act. And insurance regulators across the country are working through both of those pieces of legislation to see how they interact with state law and to see where there, there might be preemption. Um, and where the federal government takes over some of the aspects of regulation versus um, the, the primary regulator being the, the, the states. Uh, insurance has been regulated by the states since McCarran uh, Ferguson. Uh, there's a whole history of, of law of why uh, the states uh, continue to control their insurance markets, markets from a regulatory standpoint. Um, so I thought I'd capitalize or, and emphasize some things that have not changed uh, in the interaction with the Affordable Care Act and give you um, sort of the flavor of what we continue to work on um, in the state. So if you think of the major three areas of insurance regulation, the first of which is company regulation, which is solvency regulation. And if you think of the primary uh, consumer protection, it's to ensure that an insurance company uh, is financially solvent and has claims paying capital to always meet the promises that they've made. Um, and there is uh, virtually nothing in the Affordable Care Act uh, that impacts the state's ability to continue to regulate the solvency of insurance companies. It's by far our number one priority in the department to ensure that uh, insurance companies remain viable uh, and that they are able to pay claims. Under state law, if a, an insurance company does get into hazardous financial condition or into rehabilitation or receivership, that falls on my desk to act as the receiver, so it's imperative that uh, we try to keep those uh, market participants viable. Uh, our market in Missouri is very concentrated uh, in health insurance. Um, uh, just the top four players in Missouri um, make up a little over 90% of the market. So it's a very concentrated market and probably one of the less competitive markets um, in all of our insurance areas. The second area besides company insolvency regulation that we focus on is market regulation. So every policy form that is filed in the state, irrespective of the line of business, but including health, is approved by the department before it goes to consumers. Um, and that's an area that we've had some interaction on because the state remains, retains that ability to um, approve and enforce policy provisions and state law continues um, to be dominant and must be followed in all those policy forms. Um, and now we have, the, and including the state mandates that have, have been passed by the legislature. So now we have the addition of some of the um, requirements of the Affordable Care Act that then those must be then regulated to a certain extent uh, by HHS or CMS. I'll give you an example of one where we've had some interaction where uh, we had to reconcile the two laws. Um, a few years ago, the legislature passed a, a landmark uh, insurance mandate uh, bill for autism. Uh, essentially, applied be, uh, the, the crux of the bill relates to applied behavioral analysis for children, uh, ABA therapy, and having an insurance mandate at the time uh, at a $40,000 cap per, uh, per year. Um, and it's a, um, it, it is a life-changing uh, reform for uh, families with children on the autism spectrum disorder. The uh, ACA, for instance, uh, requires that there cannot be a, a, a dollar cap on a benefit like ABA therapy. Missouri law requires that there can't be a per visit cap, that there was a dollar cap. So you can see where this is going, a little bit of a, a collision here. Um, now, uh, ACA says eventually in the guidance and, and regulations say that there can be an actuarial equivalent, which would, some people would translate that into a per visit cap, but again, state law does not require per visit cap. So it's an area that we worked uh, with the carriers um, on discussion when they're filing their forms 
for 2014, their policy forms. Um, and th the good thing about that particular um, uh, provision, that particular benefit, is we've had a couple of years of experience on it. And we, the department does an annual report of what that benefit is costing. It is a very, a relatively low spend for carriers, about one-tenth of one percent of their overall claim spend, but it's very meaningful for those recipients that receive that benefit. So what carriers have ultimately decided to do is to take away both of those caps. So that's a consumer win in Missouri. So you no longer have a, the $40,000 cap in most policies, and you won't have that per visit cap that would have been allowed. So that's just an example of how we're reconciling uh, the two areas. So we have company regulation. We have market regulation. And then finally, our third leg of the stool for regulation is consumer affairs. And this is really where the, um, where the rubber meets the road, where we help individual consumers that come to us where they've reached an impasse with their insurance carrier. We get about 21,000 um, customer contacts a year in that area, whether it be by phone or at events or by um, uh, electronic email or um, a, web, a website touches where people are asking us questions. And much of that is an education um, component. Much of us, that is educate us, the department, educating consumers of what they've purchased um, and what they really have paid a premium for and what they're entitled to. Now sometimes that um, 21,000 then goes to a funnel and we get down to real complaints where there's an issue where um, there may be a dispute with an insurance company where they have not honored the terms of the insurance contract. And those then we take forward and adjudicate with the insurance company between the, the consumer and the uh, insurance company. And it's been, a, uh, traditionally it's been a very strong area um, in Missouri of where we help consumers when they reach that impasse. The, um, so the, those three areas will continue to operate in the health market. Um, we're seeing obviously a lot of activity on the consumer side with consumers calling us for how particular sections of uh, insurance may apply. And we also, of course, get a lot of questions about what's next and where do we go for more information. So we very much serve in a clearinghouse and we'll continue to serve in that role um, as we go forward on, on health insurance issues. I did just want to briefly highlight two areas where we're uh, moving forward to implement state law that also has an interaction uh, with the Affordable Care Act. Uh, the first one came out of Senate Bill 262 and relates to the licensing of navigators by the state. And so, um, the, um, as you know, the um, CMS awarded navigator grants to two major organizations in Missouri, but the state has retained the ability to license the navigators. And so, um, um, and it's in 376-2000. So we did an emergency rule after the bill was signed, um, uh, effective August 3rd. Uh, we then uh, did some testing, uh, put that available for people that are interested in becoming a navigator, uh, a state licensed navigator, and that testing is now available through a third party vendor. Um, and then as of yesterday, we have about 304, we do have 304 licensed navigators. Um, and more importantly, we have uh, about 70 entities, 68 entities that have been licensed uh, in the state. So we're seeing quite a bit of activity in that regard. Um, and those navigators, the fees are, are, are relatively nominal. It's $25 fee for two year individual license and the testing fees um, uh, $41, again, with this third-party vendor. So we'll continue to be active in that area, and it's very similar to the way we license and regulate uh, insurance producers, formerly known as brokers and producers in the state, of uh, brokers and agents in the state. So uh, uh, we see some similarities there, and hopefully some efficiencies in, in putting them together in terms of regulation. And then finally, the other area where we're seeing some interaction, the other part of 262, uh, Senate Bill 262, was the, um, the closure of our residual market. So some of you may not realize, every line of insurance in the state of Missouri has a residual market. So for people that cannot get insurance in the 
commercial market, we have a residual market set up where you can get insured for whatever your insurance need may be. So for instance, if you're a small business and you're not able to get uh, workers' compensation coverage in the commercial market, we have a residual market where you can get workers' compensation coverage. Obviously, that's going to be at a price that's higher than the commercial market. We have it for medical liability. We have it for uh, homeowners if you're not able to get a homeowner's coverage. We also have it for health. Um, and so the Missouri health insurance pool, since the early 90s, we were really a, a, a leading state for the residual market in healthcare, um, has about 4,000 uh, Missourians that receive their health coverage through the, uh, the residual market. These are people that are high spenders, obviously. They're people that have sought out coverage um, by statute. Their coverage premiums have to be between 125 and 150 percent of the commercial marketplace. Um, so this is coverage that is more expensive, but there are also people that use that coverage frequently. And uh, by statute, that pool will end at the end of the year as we integrate those participants um, into the commercial marketplace. So those are the two major areas that we're working on uh, at this time would be the navigator licensing and then the uh, MHIP transition into the commercial market. So I'm happy to take some questions when we do uh, have time to do it. Thank you. Thanks. Good morning, everybody. Um, yeah, it's, it's good to be here because, uh, you know, that government shutdown thing was kind of exciting there for a while. But it uh, um, came at a, sort of an, an inauspicious time. We've been working for three years to, uh, um, in, some, in some cases, three and a half years, to get up to, uh, you know, enrollment day. And I kept sort of telling people, you know, October 1st, you know, it's, it's an important day, but you know, October 5th is okay, October 17th, November 2nd, because you know, everybody doesn't have to be, um, you know, enrolled on October 1st. Unfortunately, that didn't, message didn't get out to everybody. And um, the system, as, you, as it's been well documented, was somewhat overwhelmed. Um, not only, I mean, that's not the only problem, but that's one of the major problems that, that occurred. This was sort of, uh, a summary of the website launch that uh, people sort of just weren't, they were expecting a lot, they weren't expecting nine million people in the first week, which is more people than sign on to like Southwest Airlines in, in, um, in a month. Um, don't, you know, fewer people sign on there. So I think it goes to show how many people um, really need this coverage, despite, uh, you know, I, I remember, uh, the Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell and the other U.S. Senator from uh, Kentucky, Rand Paul, were saying how Kentuckians really hated this law and really didn't want this, uh, um, you know, the uh, marketplaces to be in existence, yet they're signing up and more than 1,000 people a day or have actually enrolled in policies there. Um, Minnesota, which is running its state-based exchange, has been really, um, you know, successful. Um, in New York, I just saw a number this morning as I was scrolling on my BlackBerry. I think it's something like 60,000 people already have, have uh, enrolled, actually enrolled in plans. Um, and one of the things I guess that you can take away from this that struck me is that this, there's a profound difference in the states that have embraced the law and are actually trying to make it work than in the states that have gotten in the way. And I think uh, Kentucky Governor Steve Bashir put it uh, really well in an op-ed piece in the um, New York Times, right, at, this was right as the marketplaces were opening, um, it was a, right the, the Sunday right before October 1st. He said, you know, in, for those people who are critics of the law, they need to get over it and they need to get out of the way. And I think that is, um, you know, if we have states, especially states, states are important entities. And if we, in, in those, those states that have engaged this, um, this process, um, really people are signing up and it's already making a huge difference. Um, one of the things I like to point out, especially on the Medicaid expansion, is that while it does expand the social safety net, that was not the primary motivator for that portion of the law. The primary motivator is to lower health care costs for everybody. To, to make it less expensive by getting, we're already paying for low-income people through a myriad, through myriad programs um, that are very inefficient and often at hospital emergency rooms, which 
Herb has talked about, you know, I think very clearly. We've got to change that system, and that's what the Medicaid expansion is really all about, to lower the cost of, of treating those people. Um, and it also has the effect of, lower, of helping everybody by lowering the cost of health insurance, because if we can get low-income people, who are, especially those who are high users of the medical system, into a coordinated kind of care, into a systematic care, in a primary care setting, we should be able to push down the overall cost of health care, which helps push down the overall cost of health insurance. So not expanding Medicaid affects every single person, not only in this room, but every single person in the state going forward. Anyway, I'm going to talk about a little bit about sort of what the situation is, sort of where we are. I've provided a handout of most of the substantive slides here. Um, so you can look at them. So I'm going to go through these really fast. I'm not going to really talk about each of the slides. I just I'm use them to make some points. And you can look at some of the details um, in, you know, at your leisure. And I'll hang around afterward if people have questions in addition to the question time. So I'm going to go through this pretty fast. I want to talk a little bit about the web launch because, the website launch, because obviously it's the thing on everybody's mind and it's the chief bottleneck uh, sort of that we're facing right now. There's been a few stumbles. And I think it's been a little bloody at times. Um, but those are, um, as they called it, the tech surge is going on. Those are being addressed. And I like to point out that, you know, every new version of Windows always has some glitches. I'm not trying to say they're as bad as this situation. But when, uh, you know, the last operating system for the iPhone came out, people's iPhones stopped working after three days. Um, these are not unusual. The unusual situation is usually it's not done sort of on this grand a scale. So I guess we can take credit. The Department of Health and Human Services can take credit for uh, one of the major tech, you know, things that one of the items that will go down in history is one of the big tech flubs. Um, but we'll get past it. And eventually, once, you know, if we can get this, if we can get the, these glitches taken care of, I think within the next month, you know, this will be looked back, not necessarily fondly, but looked back as a major stumbling point that people got past. This is sort of, uh, you know, as I know as people have hit different, different kinks and glitches as they come up, um, you know, somewhere in the application portion, somewhere in just the account portion, somewhere in as they were looking at, at um, actual healthcare policies. I thought it was unfortunate that this, no, this window never came up, that, you know, you can't find that file, would you like some wine instead? I think that would have, you know, perhaps would have at least made people feel better. So I think it's, but I, again, I think it's important to remember that the enrollment process is it's a marathon, it's not a sprint, it's actually a multi-year effort to get everybody signed up. Nobody ever expected to get everybody signed up the first year, um, although there are pretty ambitious goals in the number of people we're hoping to get signed up. But while well, the enrollment period began October 1st, it goes through March 31st. I think that's important to remember. We don't want people waiting to the last minute and have a repeat of October 1st, but it's, again, it's a marathon, it's not a sprint. Um, coverage begins on March, uh, on January 1st. Whether you sign up today, whether you signed up October 5th, or whether you sign up December 15th, all of those are eligible for coverage that begins January 1st. So it's not, you know, a cr the crisis that some people are, are sort of per portraying it as. Um, the second point on this slide about must be enrolled by February 15th to avoid the penalty, actually, yesterday, I wrote this Wednesday, yesterday, the White House announced that they're modifying that regulation to include everybody who enrolls by March 31st will not be subject to the penalty. The penalty would be extremely modest anyway if they only, um, if they waited till after February 1st, or February 15th rather, um, because it would only be one third of the, um, of the year and the minimum pel penalty therefore would be about $32. So the first year penalty, and I'll talk a little bit about this in a moment, but is, is more or less a teaser penalty. So, um, you know, it doesn't really, 
hit people. The second year penalty starts to become significant. The third year is a very significant penalty, up to 2.5% of your income and a minimum of $695 per adult. That starts to become real. And the thing is, most, for most people, I shouldn't say most people, for many people, the cost of health insurance, because of the way the law is, is structured, the cost of health insurance will be less than the penalty. And we're going to talk about that in, in just a moment. So moving ahead, I just want to say that keep in mind that even if you stumble, you're still moving forward. And I th think that's the attitude I think that we have to have at this point. Um, nearly 20 million unique visitors have checked out healthcare.gov just in the first three weeks. Um, and I, again, I gotta, I'm going to update this slide. I've got nearly 500,000 people have enrolled in insurance. Actually, 500, nearly 500,000 have, as of last week, had actually set up applications so their information was in and they were perusing the, the various plan options that they, they had. I think very few people expected people to enroll right away. Think about your own experience. When you enroll in insurance, if you get it through your employer, you look at the options, and I know I agonized for three days going, okay, I quickly narrowed it down to about three plans, and then I think, oh, which one's going to be better? Am I going to, you know... Should I have this higher deductible or that higher copayment? And everybody has to look at that a while before they make their decision. Um, but I just, uh, this morning, I was looking over the, on my Blackberry, I was looking over the articles that, that uh, came out yesterday. The um, administration has announced it's up to 700,000. So just in the last four days, 200,000 more people have succeeded in getting through and setting up um, accounts and put in, created applications so their financial information, other information is in the database and they can start looking at prices about what it will actually cost them, okay? Real quickly, I just wanna say, remember what the marketplaces are. They're a new, fairer system to providing health insurance. Instead of excluding people because of health, health conditions, there's only four reasons the price can be different. Age, tobacco use, location, because there's, in Missouri it has 10 rating areas, um, or your family size. Obviously, a family policy is going to cost more than an individual plan. And no longer, I think this is a really significant point, no longer will being a woman be considered a pre-existing condition. You know? Uh, <laughs> and I hear a lot of complaints, especially from insurance agents, about, well, they're requiring uh, maternity care to be covered. That's why all the prices are so, that's why, you know, prices are going up. Actually, prices aren't going up, but in any event, you know, most people end up having kids at some point in their life. The point behind this law is that if we spread these costs that everybody incurs across a large population, they'll be lower than if we try to pick it out and say, oh, this isn't going to happen to me this year. I'll, I'll just get insurance that excludes that. You know that one out of 11 policies in the private market now doesn't cover medicine? Is that really insurance if you don't cover medicine? Um, the um, this is sort of the points I was just making, I'm going to zip through here. Um, the marketing of policies, one of the big points that I like to bring up is that the website is not the only thing. It's a toll-free number, you can get help, you can also use a paper application, although I don't recommend it. Um, but the paper applications are great to practice on, to find out what information you're going to be asked to give for people to get that and say, okay, I can fill this out, know what information is going, I'm going to need. And then when you sit down at the computer, there, were peop there have been people who have been quoted from all over the country say, you know, if you're ready, if you've got all the information together, it takes about 20 minutes. When, and most of those are in the state-based websites that are actually working. But, but having said that, um, you know, we're going to get the federal website working better. I mean, these things don't get worse. They are getting better. And, um, you know, if you're ready and you've got the information you need, it's really very quick. Um, here. One of the key things about the change in the marketplace is making insurance affordable. I mean, that's the, the law's first name. Credits are available. When I say credits, most people use them as discounts. 
discounted insurance prices, um, up to 400% of the poverty level, so that's well into the middle class, $46,000 roughly a year for an individual, up to $94,200 a year for a family of four. I mean, that's well into the middle class in Missouri. This is a chart, and you're, I'm just going to talk about them briefly, but of the prices that people will actually pay. Because what it comes down to, it doesn't matter what the sticker price is if you're in this group that, is, that gets these tax credit discounts. It doesn't matter what the insurance company pays. You'll only be, you'll only be paying based on your income. Okay, and that makes it affordable. And as, as I've laid out here, an individual with a, an income of $25,800, about $26,000 a year, would, pay, would never pay more than $155 a month for insurance, and it's real insurance. It's not one of these fake policies that doesn't cover medication that you, when you show up at the doctor and you, know, you find out, oh, the lab test, those expensive lab tests you ordered aren't covered. Uh, they have to be covered. In addition, at that income level, they'll get lower co-payments than actually are called for in the policy. They'll get lower deductibles, they'll get lower total out-of-pocket costs. It really is a sea change in affordability um, for insurance. Here's for a family of four. As you can see, a family of four with the, roughly the median income in Missouri, about $53,000. Same thing. They will, the most they will pay is $317 a month. Okay. And if you're a little more, little, uh, you have a little more income, let's say it's $82,000 a year for a family of four. Well, that's not getting rich, but it's a solid income in Missouri. Monthly premiums aren't cheap because health care isn't cheap. Okay, $653, but today in Missouri, the average family plan is right at $12,000 a year. So it's $1,000 a month. That's still a $350 a month discount. Now, here's some prices of actual policies that are on the Missouri Exchange, which is Frankly, prices in Missouri are traditionally higher than most of the rest of the country. When they impose, as John was saying, we have a, not a particularly competitive market in Missouri. When the requirement from the Affordable Care Act went into effect that insurers had to spend at least 80 cents of every premium dollar on actual health services, when that went into effect, Missouri insurers refunded almost $61 million. Missouri is like as about 1.9 percent of the population in the United States. Five and a half percent of all refunds went to Missouri residents. Okay, so three times its share. So Missouri does not have a particularly robust health insurance market. But this is and different parts of the state are much more expensive than other parts. Here is a quick look at a couple of things. There's a 27 year old in Boone County. Monthly premium. And the lowest price silver plan, which is a good solid plan, 70% uh, actuarial value, which means on average, the average person would only be responsible for about 30% of his or her medical bills. The monthly premium is $242. That's the list price. But at that income level, that person would only pay $76 a month. That's a cell phone bill. So nobody is going to be, should be able to walk around saying they can't afford ins health insurance after this. Now, at a little higher income, $25,800, the lowest price silver plan would be $145 a month. Actual pay for, they could choose a less generous plan, a bronze plan, for less than $100 a month. If you look at the, at the St. Louis plans, you'll see the plans are significantly less expensive in St. Louis, much more competitive part of the state. But because of the discounts, the way they're calculated, it mitigates most of, those, of that difference. As you can see, that person making 20,000 a year, so it's a little under $10 an hour full time. In St. Louis, the sticker price is 196, but the actual payment will only be $66. So it's only $10 more in Boone County for the person at that income. Okay. I want to just go real quickly to, this is an example, and you can look at these more detail and ask me later, but about a family of four. As you can see, the St. Louis family with a, an income of $41,000 a year, 
The sticker price is $663 for the lowest price silver plan. In Boone County, it's $153 more, okay, $816. But the actual payment is only $31 a month. Because at that income, they get discounts. They can buy a plan for $141 a month. I mean, that is stunningly reasonable compared with the current market. And in Boone County, there's one, and in St. Louis County, two plans where that, that family could choose a zero cost premium. If they were willing to go to a bronze plan, the lowest cost bronze plan, it would be no cost out of pocket every month. They would still have co-payments and deductibles and other things, but the premium would be zero. So nobody should be saying health insurance is no longer affordable. Okay, here's some things, about, I, and I put this in, in the handout so you can look at it, about calculating your income, what's, what's uh, included in that. Um, this is uh, about the individual responsibility fee. Um, as I said, the first year it's kind of a teaser rate, but it goes up second year, third year, they become significant. And for many people, the cost of insurance, once you factor in those discounts, will be less than the penalty would be. So there's really no reason to forego health insurance, but on top of that, on top of that, these people, while they're worried about, you know, they're saying, oh, you know, we might not be able to, uh, to afford this, this lowers the cost for everybody <coughs> because by getting people into health insurance, giving them access to the healthcare system in a systematic way, and when they need it, we, we should low, be able to lower the price of, of the co overall cost of health care for everybody. Okay. Um, just a couple of things real quick I want to say. This is, this is the website, aka the culprit. Um, the, uh, some of the thing is the whole website is not dysfunctional. It's, uh, there's some bottlenecks in it. But things like the web chat capability. Um, there have been more than 160,000 people have had or web chats where they asked questions about how something worked or how, you know, about a particular policy and have gotten answers. Um, 1.6 million people have called the call center. We'll talk, I'll give you the number in just a moment. Um, and there's all kinds of information on the website to get prepared that is working. Okay, and then I've put stars on the last four points about, well, you can create an account. And I put, we're working on the kinks, you know. And you can provide family income information to qualify. All that, some people are getting through, OK? But it's not working for most people, most places, most of the time. And that's what we need to, to, to get fixed. Here's the phone number. If you have questions, the call center, of course, that has glitches. These are people you're dealing with. But for the most part, it's been very successful, 800-318-2596 can help you, you know, wherever you happen to be at that time, can give you some, give you information. Um, and I'd like to point out that it's available 24 seven. So if you have insomnia and you wanna call at 2.48 in the morning, go ahead and give them a call. Go ahead and test it, okay? Um, for small employers, there's also a website. It's not 24 hours a day, it's basically business hours, East Coast time, but it's operating from uh, 8 a.m. to 6 p.m central time, so it will cover the entire business day, and there's the number for that. Um, when the website, because I, I looked at some of the beta versions, when the website's working, it's really a wonderful thing. You really, the calculator, the comparison tool, which is borrowed from the Federal Employee Health Benefits Program, is really good to compare these different things. Um, the filtering options allow you to look at the ones that you're most interested in, whether it's the lowest premium or it's the lowest copays. Whatever you're interested in, you can, you can put in different filtering options. It really works well. Um, I want to say just one last thing is about the, um, I think this segues into the people who are talking after here, after me, um, are the sources of enrollment help. Navigators, they're kind of the all-stars you know, the SEAL Team 6, if you will, will of the uh, effort to get people um, enrolled. I know Jeremy appreciates that. Uh, he looks sort of SEAL Team 6-esque. Anyway, um, but they receive grants from the marketplace um, to 
coordinate this, and um, you know they work with key groups. They don't turn anybody away. Um, they ha have the biggest job to do. But there's really not very many of them. Um, there's only two groups in Missouri that received $1.8 million. Unfortunately, the money that was in the law when it was passed is all the law we're getting. And uh, $1.8 million doesn't go a long way, but they're doing yeoman's work with it. Um, Primaris Healthcare Business Solutions is the lead agency for a consortium of uh, 11 community partners. Uh, the Missouri Alliance on Area Agencies on Aging got, also got um, $750,000 to do similar work. The second set of groups, sort of our boots on the ground, the foot soldiers are the apl certified application counselors. And they have less training than the um, than the navigators, but it's still uh, the training needed to get people through the application process and help them pick out a plan. Um, and again, they uh, um, to ensure unbiased advice, um, they can't accept any compensation from any um, health insurance organization um, in connection with the enrollment. And they have to disclose any conf potential conflicts of interest. If your agency is interested in becoming a certified application counselor agency, um, it's really the, the application is really simple. Um, it's, on, it's online at healthcare.gov, um, excuse me, on um, marketplace.cms.gov. You can go there and um, you can uh, you know, fill out the application and eventually there's been a few bottlenecks, but this is, they're getting resolved. Um, uh, you, you know, you'll get a package back, a welcome package back from CMS um, with information and other um, uh, you know, resources, basically posters, brochures, on links to information. Licensed insurance agents, I sometimes say these are the Darth Vader's of the, uh, um, the enrollment process, but they are an important link. Uh, they are the reason that uh, there's a state licensing requirement in Missouri for navigators. Um, because they nationwide they tried to throw up roadblocks because they see this uh, the navigators as competition because camp competitions will do for free what you know they they charge you know basically get a commission for um, the thing is the people who the navigators and certified application counselors are helping are not the group that that insurance agents want okay they do not oop, I hit something they do not want to, um, to deal with somebody who's never had insurance before and needs to be explained what health insurance is and why it's important and how it works, okay? That's the group that certified application counselors and navigators are working with, and it's time-consuming and, frankly, difficult. Um, but that's what the volunteers and staff of those groups are doing. But having said all that, um, health insurance agents and brokers will be an important uh, player in getting people enrolled, but you got to remember they're not unbiased. They represent insurance companies. They do not represent the client. That's in the regulations. They represent insurance companies, not the client. So if you get involved in enrollment you, and you're a, as an application counselor agency or as a navigator, you really shouldn't be working alongside licensed insurance agents because you serve a different population. You serve the client, not the insurance company. Um, okay. And oh, one, one other thing. Oh, um, I just like to say about privacy of personal information. I can't, frankly, it's hard for me to imagine a lot of uh, um, thieves targeting very poor people to, uh, to steal their identities, but maybe it happens. Um, but there are a lot of controls in there, in, in, the, in the regulations and in the requirements about you know, protecting um, personal information. Um, and organizations and individuals who violate those privacy protections, um, the Justice Department has said very emphatically they are going to be investigated and um, the general fraud statutes will, will apply. And under the, um, these regula the Affordable Care Act's regulations, Every act is punishable by up to a fine of $25,000. So um, there's real teeth in the uh, sec personal security issues. And one final thought I want to say, 
That opportunity, as Thomas Edison said, opportunity is missed by most people because it dresses in overalls and it looks a lot like work. None of this is going to be easy, but and as we've seen with the uh, glitches in the website, but um, we are moving forward on that. And the bottom line is that we're going to have a lot more people insured. We're going to have an, a lot more people with access to health care, and that benefits all of us. So, thanks. I want to thank all of our panelists. Uh, you know, I've often thought we should have, uh, before the um, rollout of the website, we should have gotten together the policy wonks and the journalists and said, let's all stay off the website. Because <laughs> I always wonder how many of us with insurance were playing with it to see how it worked. Mm -hmm. Guilty, guilty. So. All right. So, and also, you know, I'll, I'll just say the comment, this is a marathon. I worked for the Republicans in the 106th Congress as an RWJ, RWJ Health Policy Fellow, you know, t over 10 years ago now. And so we were talking then about health reform, shoring up the safety net, using the private market, doing insurance reforms, and then they would whisper, and there has to be an individual you know, so here we are in 2013, shoring up the safety net, doing insurance reforms, relying on the marketplace for the insurance expansion, and we have an individual mandate. So this is a marathon, and I think it'll probably take, you know, another 12 years um, to get it figured out. So uh, we do, we're, we're running a little bit late, but we have ch a, ch a minute for just a few questions, and Dave's got the microphone. Hi, thanks so very much. This has really been interesting hearing all the different perspectives. Um, I'm Deborah Howenstein. I'm a family physician here in Columbia, and I work a lot with people who are under 100% of poverty level, so they will not be able to benefit with the new options that are here. There are also quite a number of them that are right at the cutoff, and I'm just sort of wondering how we're going to deal with people that one a uh, six-month period might be at 110% of poverty level and the next six-month period at 95% of poverty level and what what options and obligations they have in terms of both access and uh, penalties. Thanks. And I, I guess that's probably addressed to, I'm um, sorry, Kit Wagner, thanks. Okay. I'll just leave it there. Okay. Um, if they're that close, remember this is a prediction. Okay. It's all done on an estimate going forward. I think you have to be truthful, but it's an estimate. If somebody, the, if you're talking about an individual, the poverty level for this year, it'll be slightly higher next year, um, is $11,490. So if they say, well, you know, I think I'm going to make 11000 the thing I would do is say, do you think you can get a few more hours? Do you think you can, you know, chop some wood? Can you, uh, you know, um, work for somebody, you know, work, especially if, if a lot of people have disabilities at that income level. Can you work with the local disability agency to make a little bit more money, or at least estimate that you're going to make a little more money? Because the IRS has said that they will not try to recoup a tax, a credit, a tax credit that was used for a discount on um, health insurance based on a good faith estimate of somebody's um, income. So if somebody estimates they're going to make 13000 a year and they get sick or they get in a car wreck or something, they end up only making $9,000 that year, the IRS is extremely unlikely, unless there's some fraud involved, to come back and ask for the, a repayment. Because, oh, in, in retrospect, you didn't qualify for that. As long as it was a good faith estimate that their income was going to be above the poverty level. Now, the other issue of if they're below the poverty level, basically, if they're definitely below the poverty level and they don't, won't qualify for the, the health insurance discounts, they automatically qual qualify for um, a, an exemption, a hardship waiver of the penalty. So the, they don't have to worry about the penalty. Um, but basically, they're in the same position they're in now. They rely on safety net clinics. Uh, community health centers are an important part of that. Um, the, um, um, you know, the, the problem isn't fixed is the, is the, hor the problem, but that's a state decision. 
I know you can smell lunch, but other questions? <laughs> okay, well, uh, the panelists will be around, so. Oh, I'm sorry, Dr. Zweig. Um, thanks for uh, the explanation about the exchanges. And um, I guess I'm a little concerned that those who have very little resources um, will purchase the uh, least expensive option, not fully understanding, because they've commonly not had health insurance, uh, that of the impact of deductibles and copayments that might actually preclude them from getting continuous uh, management of their chronic diseases, which actually we all know contribute the most to health care costs in our system. Is there a way that, that people have been uh, counseled to help them, or, do you, or are you optimistic that we will not actually keep people from seeing their primary care physician by giving them insurance? I'll answer it quickly. If somebody else has additional um, points, um, that's fine. But the short answer is yes. That's part of the training that the navigators and certified application counselors get is how to help people pick a plan. Um, one of the big issues is, what is your health condition? You know, for me, it was relatively healthy. If I avoid falling off a mountain like I did a year and a half ago and tearing two tendons in my shoulder, as long as I can avoid that, I'll be willing to, you know, I, I don't want a high deductible because I'll never use the health insurance. But other people, if they're a chronic condition, maybe they want either, they, they, it's two ways of looking at it and they have to make the decision, but based on do they want a high deductible that they know they're going to hit and then get very rich benefits after that deductible is met, or do they want to get a plan that is very low deductible because they're going to immediately start getting these things? These are the kinds of issues. The trade-offs between deductible, co-payments, and premiums have to be explained to people. It doesn't mean everybody's going to understand it the first time. Let's face it, it takes a few years to really understand how your health insurance policy works. But that kind of information you know, is supposed to be available if they're seeking help. And there's a lot of information about those things on the healthcare.gov website that tries to guide people through that trade-off between upfront costs and payment at, at the, at the uh, point of service. I would just say your, your point's well taken. From a provider perspective, um, the high deductible health plans, we still view those people as basically uninsured. You come in with a $5,000 deductible, um, there is no possibility that those folks are going to be able to make those. And so for all intents and purposes, they continue to be uninsured. Yeah, and I would just add that, you know, we have the federally funded navigator grants in the state through Prim Primaris and the area agencies on aging. And then we have the certified application counselors funded by the Missouri Foundation for Health and other organizations. And we also have University of Missouri Extension in every county going out doing education on these issues. So there's probably more people out educating on these issues than it might seem at first glance. I, I would just add that it's, it's three-pronged to educate people. Uh, obviously, people understand deductibles more because it's in every line of business. Co-insurance, people understand less, but they need to. But really what they need to understand is that out-of-pocket max and what kind of expenditures erode that out-of-pocket max because that's what people need to be planning for uh, because that's worst-case scenario uh, before that insurance kicks in at 100%. Um, I think we will, any other questions before we wrap up, Ivana? I, uh, we had a question from Twitter uh, regarding the 304 uh, licensed navigators for John Huff. Are, do they also have the federal uh, training and license shows? So that's a mix of, of, of um, of folks that have taken the state exam or have taken and successfully passed one of the exams uh, um, that have offered uh, through CMS. And so the entire listing, uh, including contact information, is available on the website, insurance.mo.gov, um, for the entities and the individual navigators. Thank you very much. Okay, can, and, uh, can you give the microphone to um, Aaron Sweeney real quick and have him, Aaron is a local, um, certified application counselor at the Family Health Center? Yeah, so uh, I'm the kind of head certified application counselor at Family Health Center here in Columbia, and Karen asked me to kind of speak to our experiences. Um, and, uh, you know, we had a lot of frustration with the website, probably more than anybody else here, because we were just, you know, kind of banging our heads trying to get it to work. Um, 
But I will, to make Kit happy, it is working much better than it was. You know, I haven't had any issues with account creation in the last week. Um, and at this point, a lot of people who come in and talk to me, at least um, in our clinic, are more looking for information. They don't, they're not ready to go through the application process. And so, you know, that's something that we've been able to satisfy um, our patients with. Um, and a, an unfortunate part of working at an FQHC is we have a huge patient population that falls under that, falls in the Medicaid coverage gap. Um, and so, I, you know, I, I ran this report with Deborah the other week. Um, you know, we can, we can look at how many of our patients each day fall into this gap. And I think, you know, we probably have 20 to 25 percent of our patients every day um, don't have coverage and are under 100 percent of the federal poverty level. Um, and so that's, you know, with those patients, they get a sense of frustration because they're not going to get help, but they also get a sense of relief about the fact that they're not going to have to pay this penalty. You know, they've just been kind of scared about like, oh, I'm going to get penalized, I'm going to get penalized, you know. Um, and so they're happy to know that they're not going to have to pay a penalty. Um, and, you know, they kind of come away hopeful that maybe Medicaid will expand um, in the future. But things are going a little better than they were a couple weeks ago. And Did you tell me you signed somebody up yesterday? Uh, I got all the way through an application. He didn't um, <laughs> submit it because there was one thing he had a question about and he wanted to get answered. But okay. everything else went really smoothly. It took about 45 minutes. Okay. Um, so, uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you, Aaron. Jeremy, would you um, care to make a comment about your organization? Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Jeremy Malarski. I run the Navigator program at Primaris. As Kit mentioned, uh, we are not taking a go it alone approach with this. We are a coalition of 11 total healthcare and nonprofit organizations. And as a result, there's a little bit of a laboratory feel about it because different members of our coalition are taking different approaches to outreach and education. Our mission right now is how to counsel with a challenging website. And there are lots of tools that we have at our disposal to help people. As Aaron mentioned, a lot of people just have questions. A lot of people don't know what this law is about, don't know how this affects them, don't know what the plans are or what they cost. They don't know whether they can afford this. And there are things in the law that, uh, that play, think, items in the law that dictate how much you'll pay. As you saw with Kit's charts, there's only, there, it protects you against overpaying for insurance. Most people don't know that. So they tell us, they come in, they tell us their, their income, and then they find out. I'll, I'll give you an example, because I like stories too, like Susan. I have a client this week. She's in her early 30s. She has her own small business. She does a massage. Her husband is a full-time student at AMU. And she is one of the six, she Gave me her income, obviously after signing a consent form, and you know I promised and signed in my blood that I wasn't going to steal her identity. That uh, she would, uh, she had access to a bronze plan. She would be one of the six in ten that the Bureau of Labor is going. It says will pay less than a hundred dollars a month, and and as Kit said, that's it's, that's a cell phone bill for health insurance, which she's never had. Health insurance that can't charge her more because she's a woman health insurance that has to cover essential benefits. And again, most people don't know that. So no, she couldn't get through healthcare.gov, and no, she couldn't actually enroll in a plan that session, but she walked away happy. And we've had a couple people like that. You know, we're, we're not sitting on our hands here. You know, we, we, we are all trained. Uh, CACs uh, have you know, five hours, of, navigators have 20 hours of federal training. We learn something every day. And we can learn more about these policies every day. And we're able to give out more information every day. You know, th th this, is, this is not for si wilting little flowers. You know, healthcare.gov is a broken door. It's not a broken store. The, the law is still in effect, and, it's still, and, it, and for a lot of people, it's going to give them something they never had before. Uh, and so in the first two weeks, uh, we have had more than 250 people come in and out of our doors for coalition-wide. We have had um, uh, a good number, about eh, 20, 24 people we've able, been able to create accounts for. 
And for some people, we were able to get through the application up to the point of enrollment. Uh, most of those are Medicaid gap people. So there's been a few Medicaid gap people that get through all the, uh, get through the, 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 uh, the income application, but their income is near zero. So they're not shown plans because they're, they don't make enough to file for taxes and therefore they're exempt from the marketplace. Now, not, a, not exactly a happy sunshine and rainbow story, but they, at least they know what's going to happen, how, where they stand, and that they're not going to get a tax penalty or anything crazy like that. So we have uh, a lot of different approaches, and, and some of them are working. And when it, our approach has always been, when it works, we're going to continue doing it. When it doesn't work, we're going to stop. There's nothing you know, complicated about that. And we continue to get better every day. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much.